Uh, so I'm, start, I'm trying, trying to start a tradition, which is having a picture of the audience up on Twitter. Um, so I'm going to shoot your pictures, uh, and then they're going to go up on Twitter. And so we're just going to do that half the room, because this room is wide enough that I can't get the entire thing. But um, anyway, I just, ju just announced the uh, talk on Twitter, so hopefully people will tune in for the uh, live stream. Oh, hang on. I actually need to post this now. There. Hopefully it's done. And now I need to turn, turn on my phone in airplane mode for this uh, gentleman over here, which we are going to do. OK. All right. So thank you for the introduction. And I want to say thank you again to the organizers of this group. It's been a fantastic workshop. This is the last day. I'm going to try and keep things a little bit light. We're going to have a light introduction. There'll be some meat at the end, um, but we're going to have a little bit, bit of fun with this talk. Um, so there's some missing stuff in my title, some words, some gaps, some obvious problems with it. Anyway, we're going to look at, at, at sort of what these are from a large scale matrix comp computations perspective for network problems. Um, so I, this talk is going to involve a, a lot of very old references. So this is the first paper that someone pointed me to that uh, takes a network and looks at it as a matrix. So this is a study of children playing in a preschool from 1928. Um, this is by someone named Helen Bott, written in something called Gen Genetic Psychology Manuscripts. I, this journal no longer exists. Um, but here is the picture that they had in there. Uh, so if you remember back on day one, we saw lots of people drawing adjacency matrices, or sorry, networks as adjacency ma matrices. This may be the first adjacency matrix ever plotted. I, if someone knows references that go before this, I'd, I'd love to hear, 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 hear about them. There's actually some interesting stuff here. They, they have five different attributes. Um, for each of the links here, which is how the kids were playing with each other and how many times they played, played each other. So if you just blink and say, we're going to put an edge where there was any interaction at all, you get this really dense network. Um, and throughout the rest of the talk, we're going to take networks and look at them as matrices. So we're just going to buy, buy into this uh, methodology. OK, so whenever you have uh, the matrix, it, there was this movie a whole, many, a, a, a whole bunch of years ago uh, called The Matrix that makes for good jokes and talks. Uh, so here, now you have a choice. So if you remember the movie, there was a choice. You could either learn how the world really works, or you could stay sort of blissfully ignorant. Um, so here, we're going to have a red pill and a blue pill. The red pill is you're going to accept uh, what uh, or, or sorry, at least temp temporarily accept what might be called the matrix thesis, which is that everything that's computable on a computer might be best explained as a matrix problem. Um, the, the blue pill is, of course, uh, uh, the case where you can believe whatever you want to believe, and, and the rest of the talk, you'll, you'll wake up and, and, and you won't remember any of this stuff. So we're going to see how far the rabbit hole goes. Uh, uh, with, with looking at these things as matrices. OK, uh, then when you're a grad student, you also spend lots of time making uh, uh, pictures. So this is my advisor, Jean Golub, who sadly passed away about six years ago. Um, but Char 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 Charlie Van Loan is very much alive. Um, these two guys wrote what's, what's commonly called the Bible on matrix computations. It's now in uh, volume four. Uh, but if you're interested in matrix computations, you haven't seen them formally yet. I'm assuming that's not like, I'm, I'm assuming most people here have seen most of these things before. But this is a great, great uh, reference to start from after you've read a couple of the other ones. This is a reference book. It's not a teaching book. So it's great once you sort of know things and need to look up esoteric de details about how to implement the methods or how, 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 how they vary. OK, so uh, normally I would have said matrix computations in a nutshell. Um, but here we're going to do red pill instead, because this is the red pill c c scenario. So the, the, the sort of standard litany in matrix computations is that once you state a problem as a matrix problem, you want to take the structure of that problem and use it to solve your problem better. Okay, so what does better mean? Well, it depends on the application. So better might be more accurately. So I have some friends working on solving problems in quadruple precision arithmetic because they get the wrong answer if they solve it in double precision arithmetic. Um, 
I have other friends working on solving things faster because they need things uh, uh, just to go faster. They're running on a supercomputer and they and and it would take them a year to solve their problem right now and they want to solve it in a week. So a year to a week is a big improvement in speed. But the idea throughout all of the field is to use the structure of a particular matrix problem in order to make things better. So what we're going to do is see how that plays out in terms of a particular graph algorithm. All right, so in general, this is my research area. So what, 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 what I do as a person is if you come to me with a problem, the first thing I'm going to do is state as a matrix problem. So that's, that's, that's sort of me taking the red pill wholeheartedly. Uh, but what we're going to see today is a whole bunch of, or actually just really one application of this to uh, network analysis. And then um, one other application at the end on tr uh, network alignment that I'll, I'll briefly allude to is it's an interesting area of open problems where we really do need help um, as far as pushing things, things uh, 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 further. All right, so what's, what are we going to see in this talk? We're going to see one canonical problem um, from this perspective of taking a problem and looking at it as a matrix. And this is uh, solving a linear system of equations that comes from a network. So here A is going to be our adjacency matrix. D is going to be our, our degree matrix. So what we're doing here is we're taking our adjacency matrix, transposing it, and, and hitting it with our inverse degrees. And then we're solving a fixed point of this equation. Um, so are there markers somewhere? I'm, an, I'm just going to write this up on the board. So because this, if I, I don't remember if I put this on all of the other slides. But the vast majority of this talk is going to be about solving this equation. Or if you write it as more of the standard fixed point equation, um, this is just alpha A transpose D inverse X plus F. All right, uh, so those of you who know about these things will recognize this as the page rank equation. So she's talk, 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 talked about this uh, last time. This is also personalized page rank depending on what you choose F to be. Um, it's also uh, something called semi-supervised learning on graphs. So in Art Owen's talk, he, he alluded to some of these uh, results. But you can take many of the equations that people use for semi-supervised learning on graphs, where you have a label at some of the nodes, and you want to interpolate it to uh, the rest of the nodes as solving an equation of this form as well. People use this equation to do all sorts of different things. So one of them is protein function pr pr prediction. You know some functions of proteins, and you want to see uh, what the function of other proteins in your network might be. People use this to do gene association experiments. You have a noisy sample uh, from an experiment, and what you want to do is figure out what your, your, your measured data on genes might, might uh, have missed. Um, I, I don't have time to talk about this, but it's actually used for, for uh, that network alignment problems. And uh, there was a really curious application of this to studying food webs. What they wanted to know was what was the most important species in a network, or in a food uh, uh, network. And what they did was they would compute the solution of this equation, remove a species from the network, and see how much damage that would do to, to your solution of that vector. So solving this equation comes up all over the place in sort of applied network science. So, so it's used all over the point. What are these two alpha and f parameters? So f is generally given. We're going to look at one very special case with f and alpha. You can either interpret as the teleportation parameter in page rank. So the way I'm stating it here is where alpha is equal to 1 is the hard case, and alpha is equal to 0 is the trivial case. Um, or you can interpret it as a regularization parameter, or it's some type of error in your network. There's, there's a lot of different ways of thinking about that, that uh, number. So we've already seen this a couple times. So Vahab ta talked about this on Monday. Carl talked about this on Monday. Both of them were using this to do clustering analysis. So they were finding good communities or clusters of your network by solving these equations and looking at their solutions. And they, of course, want to solve, solve, solve them fast. Art used this in his talk on prediction yesterday. Jen had one slide on it in a slightly different form, uh, but she did have an equation that looked, looked uh, like, like uh, this with a couple of twists on there. Um, and then I know Sebastiano Vigna has looked at this a lot in other contexts, um, including centrality and, and ranking, although he gave a talk on something different here. So 
Again, we've seen a lot of these, uh, these equations over the course of the week. Let's just sort of be entirely concrete here and look at one example of this. So here's a very small network. The system of equations we solve is an identity matrix here, minus, now what happens when we do, uh, do this particular trans transformation is the outlinks of a particular node go into a column of our matrix. So here node one actually links to every one in the graph. And so we get a non-zero entry in every, uh, in, in every row in that column. Now it turns out that this matrix D here is the inverse of your degrees. So the node one here has, has a degree six. So we take all of those entries and divide them by six. And so all we're doing with this operation is cooking up a particular stochastic matrix for a graph. So this is a column stochastic matrix. If you're a probabilist, you're probably about to shoot me because you're used to thinking of row stochastic ma matrices, but I'm a, a matrix analyst, so things are column stochastic. Um, this equation works fine if you, if, as long as you have a sub-stochastic matrix. So as long as the sum of each column is bounded above by one and it's a non-negative uh, matrix. So this, <laughs> this handles all sorts of different graphs and all sorts of problems you can run into. You can pretty much just state this equation on any graph you want and it always has a unique su solution. Um, which is because this is actually a non-singular a, a non linear system. Okay, so here's an example of what a solution of this looks like on a slightly bigger graph. So this is Newman's net science graph. This is one that's slightly bigger and easy enough to plot. So this is 400 vertices. Um, I, I think of these things in terms of number of non-zeros in your matrix. This is twice the edge count if you like thinking of, of undirected edges, but the two are largely equivalent. Now what I've done is I've just solved this where I set F to have one single entry. So f was equal to 0 everywhere except one node and it was 1. So this is the personalized page rank case we'll discuss in most of the rest of the talk. So f was just 1 there and you can see what this does is it sort of gives you larger nodes or more color on nodes that are close by. So as she's talk, talked about this in terms of a distance measure, there, there are some nice relationships between this and sort of approximate distance measures and graphs. But what we're doing here is just uh, sort of illustrating what you see with these. And this is actually the case we're going to look at for the rest of the talk. So we're going to look at just computing the page rank vector, the personalized page rank vector for a single node, which means we're just looking at a single column of the inverse of this matrix. These solutions have very special properties. They're localized. So what do I mean by that? Suppose I take this and run it on an even bigger graph. So this is a six, or a, sorry, a 800,000 node, six million edge crawl of Flickr I did it a couple of year, years ago. If I just compute the solution of this in MATLAB and then run plot on it, what happens is the solution looks like this. So I'm showing he, you the magnitude of the solution at every node in this 800,000 node graph. So if you look at this, you say, well, it's zero on most of the, the graph, right? No? It's, it, it looks like it's zero the way I'm plotting it here, except for these, I think there's actually 12 uh, little spikes here. So this is what I mean by a localized uh, uh, solution. This thing looks like it only has a few significant entries in it. Now, it turns out that that's not entirely true. What I'm doing here is I'm showing you the error in uh, your, your, your computed solution with k non-zero. So, so I'm looking at the solution with the k largest entries in this, and I'm saying how much of the total solution does that explain? And so what you can see here is you get an initial DK and then sort of a long, 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 long tail here. So this ends up being about 12 here. I think there's 14. So there's 14 really large entries here and then everything else is sort of about the same order of ma ma magnitude. So these are what I'll call localized solutions. All of these entries are mathematically non-zero. So it's not like there's rounding errors or anything. There. They're all really not zero. So these, these are not sparse. All right, what's the complexity of this? 
Well, if you state as a linear system, this is trivial, it's O of n cubed. Of course, we can do better than that. Um, if you state this as a sparse linear system on an undirected graph, it turns out you can open up your latest stock and fox proceedings and look at the latest result on solving SDD systems on graphs. So I, I can never rem rem remember what this is, but they keep beating away at constants that look like m here is a number of edges, and so this is some, 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 some function there. Um, now, of course, you don't need any of this. You can just look at what's called the Neumann series of this particular linear system and get an O of m, or where m is the number of edges al algorithm. But can we do better? So I said that the answers were localized. Can we do, do any better? I said this was a talk about old algorithms. So here's a paper from 1950s on solving linear systems using Monte Car Carlo methods. So uh, this paper actually was never published. It was originally come up, it, so it, it, it was originally an idea that came up by von Neumann and Ulam. Um, and what they did is they said, if you construct a particular random walk in any matrix, you can solve AX is equal to B by simulating this random walk. And so they go on to uh, describe it in about a page. So this is effectively a Monte Carlo. It, it's a generalization, or it's a, it's a more general way of solving any system of linear equations uh, modulo some small d details with a Monte Car 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 Carlo approach. Supposedly, this was used in the Manhattan Project to actually solve some of the physics equations that they needed to uh, use there. All right, so she's told, told us a little bit about these, but these have a long history of being used for doing page rank computation. And as she said, you get really good complexity results for these. So these run in sublinear time in the size of your network. So if you want to solve a page rank system, you just need to do approximately O of log of the number of vertices work in order to solve one of those page rank systems using a Monte Carlo method. That's fast. All right, I don't know if I'm going to have time to go through this, so we'll see how much I do, how much I get through. Uh, there's another really old class of methods to solve AX is equal to B. So this is a linear system. So A here on this single slide is not the adjacency matrix of a network. It's a general linear system. I'm just describing it this way. So if you open up Golub and Van Loan, you might be able to figure out what this has to do with what they talk about as gauss seidel there. How do you run gauss seidel or what's called Gauss-Southwell? And I'll explain the difference in a second. Well, all you do at every step of this method is you take your current solution or an approximation of the solution xk and you change a single entry in it j. So all you do is alter one single non-zero entry, sorry, one single entry in your solution vector. And the way you pick it, sorry, the way you change that single entry is you make sure that the jth equation in your uh, uh, set of linear equations is satisfied. So what you do is you set the residual to uh, zero. So these are often called relaxation methods because what you do is you relax the jth term and then make sure your equation satisfies that. So you, you relax one single constraint, solve it. These are also called coordinate descent methods and if, if your matrix has some particular uh, uh, properties. So how do you choose these things? Well, in Gauss-Seidel, you just cyclically run through all the coordinates of your matrix. So if you look at gauss seidel in the book, they say we're just going to run for each row of our matrix from 1 to, to uh, n and just repeat that. There's another rule called Gauss-Southwell where what you do is you look at this equation that has the highest violation of this. So you look at what's called the residual vector and pick the element of the residual vector that's the worst. All right, so now what happens is we have a generic method. What we want to do is apply it to page rank. Do I have enough time to go through this? Yes, good, okay. So there's two ways you can apply this to page, page rank. And this is something I'm not sure en enough people know. But uh, so, so, so I'm gonna uh, at, at, at least explain it to uh, this, this uh, crowd and also record it for my students. So when they have to learn it in the future, I have a, a nice uh, recording of it. What happens when you look at this set of equations here and look at the jth row of it? Well, when you have this on a matrix, that just means you're looking at a particular node j. So here j is going to represent the blue node in our graph. And what we want to do is figure out how we're going to change that coordinate of the page rank vector. 
Well, so what we do is for this simple equation, we just write out what the page rank solution looks like. So here I've got x. Here, here I'm going to write this equation out and look at the jth co co coordinate and then just alter that one. Now, this identity matrix on the jth coordinate means that this term is going to stand by itself and all of the neighbors are going to be in the old solution. So we're just going to change one single number here. And how are you going to change it? You're going to solve this such that uh, you'll solve this equation for this term, which means I just take this bunch of numbers and add them to uh, the right-hand side. So in general, what this looks like is you solve these equations at every, at, at every row for this term here. In terms of a graph, what that means is you look at all of your inlinks and you just say, how much of my inlinks are how much are my inlinks telling me to update my page rank value? And I just say I'm going to take that update. So this is what I call page rank pull because what you're doing is you're looking at what your inlinks are telling you to uh, do, and you're pulling that information into uh, yourself. This is actually a little bit annoying because you need access to the inlinks of a node. And if you're a guy like Justin Bieber, you have about 30 million of these guys, and it might be very expensive to update your inlinks. There's another version of this called page rank push, which is where you invert this. And so what you do uh, is we're going to look at the same equation now, but where, where you have access to uh, your inlinks instead. OK, so you need one extra bit of information to, uh, to, to make this algorithm work, which is you need your residual vector. So R here is measuring how much I violate my equations at every node. So in the page rank push algorithm, what you're going to do is just take your jth coordinate and add your residual. So there should be a k here. But you're just going to add however much you violate that particular equation. Why does this work? Well, it turns out if you look at this update and the jth row of this update here, they give you exactly the same thing because the x here and the x here end up canceling out. So these two, got it. So those, 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 those two end up canceling. Then what you have to do is update RK. Updating RK involves looking at how much you've changed. Well, I've now satisfied the jth equation exactly. And so what I'm going to do is tell all of my neighbors how much they need to change their residuals by in order to account for the fact that I've updated my sol solution. So these two procedures are doing exactly the same matrix iteration. All you're doing is changing how you access the graph. So if you have easy access to inlinks, you can run the algorithm on the, le or the left. If you don't have easy access to inlinks, you can run the algorithm on the right. Um, this is approximately this many lines of Python code to have a real implementation of this. The slides will be up online soon, so I'm not going to talk about this. Um, this has been used in a whole lot of different uh, applications. So it was, I believe, first used for PageRank in this ARSU et al. paper in 2002. Um, this is exactly what a Anderson et al. use in their push algorithm. So what's the complexity of this result for computing a PageRank vector? Well, it ends up being order of machine, or sorry, order of the number of edges of your graph. Anderson et al. has a better bound, but what they do is they bound a different type of residual. So when you interpolate it back to, to uh, the actual graph, you end up getting order of edges again. Now, here's where I think there's an interesting gap. Um, if I do a Monte Car Carlo method and look at the accuracy I get after looking at this many edges. So here I'm varying how many number, how many edges the graph touches. And I'm looking at the approximation accuracy in the one norm of, of a page rank problem. So if I run a Monte Car Carlo algorithm, it decays. I, I would consider that slowly. Um, if you run a relaxation method, which is just this Gauss-Seidel procedure, it decays even more slowly, and then it gets very fast. So, this is an algorithm that's sublinear in theory because you get this shape for any size network. This algorithm is order E, except that if you want accurate solutions, you would never use this algorithm because this will take a very long time to get down, down uh, here, whereas that one always gets down there very quickly. So I claim that there are two gaps here. So the first is it'd be nice to have algorithms that are good in theory that also have this, this uh, b behavior as well. 
I also claim, claim that there's another gap here. It would be awesome to have sort of uh, non-Monte Carlo style algorithms or hybrid algorithms that give you good results up here. So I want to take this curve, shift it down there, and then take this curve and shift it down, down out of there. Um, so I'm, I'm out of time. I inadvertently put in too much in the introduction, so I apologize about that. Uh, I do want to say you can do a little bit better. So we had a, have a recent result where you use a, if you assume that there's a ZIF law in your degree distribution, you can actually get slightly better uh, asymptotic convergence results that look like D times log D times, um, this ends up being 1 over epsilon to the sixth. So don't, don't ever ask me to explain why that's, or sorry, it's 1 over epsilon to the sixth, which means it's a, it's a practically useless bound. However, if you're willing to accept that that's a constant, this gives you similar asymptotic run times if you fix epsilon. Um, I want to talk a little bit about tri triangles and make a joke on Sesh's talk, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm out of time here. So unfortunately, it, anyway, there's some interesting ideas on using triangles and including them. Um, so I guess I'd just like to end on this uh, small list of other open di directions that might be worth, worth uh, pursuing. <laughs>